Colossians, which babe was written, and I, I had to travel all over the United States. Promoters got a hold of it, Christian promoters, and I, I, I traveled for, I think, two months, t national television, radio television, and it went around the world, and I became what some would call famous. And I traveled in youth crusades. I traveled in conferences, uh, youth crusades, all of massive crusades, all the United States and around the world for five or six years. Traveled finally with two big half million dollar buses, band and massive meetings, but I start getting busy. Very busy building organization. But you see, that took me away from prayer, took me away from the altar, took me away from this word. And I re you see, I know what it's like to have the anointing and I know when it's lifted. I know when I don't have it. I know when the death moves in. I know when, I, I've had young preachers tell me that have been successful, even in the Assemblies of God, some of the most famous. One of them in particular said, I know how to move a crowd. I know how to turn on the tears. I know how to move them. I know how to fall down. Some of you are here right now, and I'm, I'm speaking into your heart and into your spirit because you have become too busy or something has taken you away from the prayer closet and now you go to the book just to get sermons and now, God bless your heart, you meditate. That there's no hunger, there's no brokenness, there's no cry. When I go into the scriptures, I look at men that God has used and there's always been a cry. Jeremiah said, I engaged my heart to seek the Lord and you'll find that there was a cry. You see, Jesus said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And that flesh has to be brought under control. That flesh has to be dealt with. There can be no anointing until the, ch until the flesh is dealt with. You have to do that is your part. You can't wait for the Holy Spirit to do that. The Holy Spirit waits for you. He said, your flesh. Otherwise, you're going to sleep at Judgment Day. You're going to be asleep when God has decided to move by His Spirit all over the world. And He needs you. He needs me. But He won't do it until we pay that price. All I've known since I was a child, young preacher, all my father and grandfather preached was pray and read your Bible. There was nothing complicated about it. Get shut in with God. Seek the face of God. I've known no other way. I've gone through all the Puritan books. I have Puritans. I began to study and read books, and I got away from this book. You can get so involved in studying how to understand the Bible that you can get away from the Word of God. I remember what it was like to stand before crowds and be dead. I stood, and when, when, when you get away from that, when you get in the flesh, when you get satisfied, everything goes out of divine order. Your home goes out of divine order. My home went out of divine order. My staff, disorder. Everywhere I turned was a disorder. And I knew it. I knew it in my heart. And I knew that I was drifting. But I got caught up. You say, how does that relate to me? I've never been famous. I've never, I, I, I would never face that kind of battle. But we all come to a time where we have to make a decision. You settle down and you pay your bills. You get a house, you get a car. There is nothing worse that I can think of for a man of God or a woman of God than to lose the anointing of God and be dead and have the knowledge that something is wrong. It was in the middle of that time, I remember the, the last days of that terrible time, the anointing had lifted, and I was going through the motions, still preaching to crowds, and after I preached, go back in a room and say, God, I can't go anymore like this. This is not the anointing, this is not what I knew. How did I get away, and how do I get back? I was known around the world as a man of God, and yet growing lukewarm and cold in my heart. And then every kind of temptation out of hell, the devil saying, I'm gonna destroy you. I'm gonna kill your minister, I'm taking you down. I was in the middle of that, or coming to the end of that period, and I was out in Long Island in the arena, 5,000 people, and they had gathered up young people from all over Long Island pastors and youth pastors that brought them in and I didn't know you see when you don't have this touch this anointing and if you are not shut in with God and you're not serious about the things of God and you're happy with the status quo 
you, you have this inner struggle. How do I get back? How do I get this anointing? How, how do I? Are you even asking these questions? Or are you even concerned? Are, are, are you sitting here tonight and asking? Are, are you examining your heart like I had to do? It's not enough to be called. I was still called. God still loved me. He bore with me. Such patience. And I got up that night and I missed God completely. I preached on marriage. My marriage at the time was being tested. I got up. It was the deadest thing I've ever done. And I went back. I knew it. I got back on my private bus. And here come the young preachers. Brother Dave, what's wrong with you? We got young people we brought in here. They're drug addicts and all these. And you preached on marriage. You miss God. I finally got so angry. I shut the door of my bus and said, I don't want to talk to anybody. It was shortly after that when I went home. I was ready to quit. Not the ministry, but that phase of it. And I remember so clearly saying, God, I, I, there was one meeting I couldn't cancel. I said, I'll go to this. Before we left the campus at our home base in East Texas, Brother Ravenhill came, great prophet of God. And he handed me a book this thick, 1,200 pages, Christian in Complete Armor by a Puritan, written 300 years ago. He said, God told me to give this to you. Read it now. I got on my bus, went back to my private room, threw it on the couch, said, who, can, who wants to read a dead man 300 years ago, 1,200 pages? I just threw it on my, so discouraged. And uh, I went 20 miles down the road, and Lord said, go back in your room and read it. I didn't go 20 pages until I was stricken totally stricken by the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, I don't know you. I don't know you. The word began to tug and pull at my heart. I shut my ministry down for a year and I got back to seeking the face of God. I got back into the word of God and put my books aside and all, all the Puritans and all the theology books. But the Holy Spirit came back and healed my marriage, healed my ministry, healed my soul. And the, the anointing came back. Ezra set his heart to seek the face of God. Nehemiah, he hears a destruction that happened in Jerusalem. And the Bible says he was overcome with grief and he set his heart to seek God. He set his heart. And you'll find it all through the Old Testament. He set his heart. Because you're going to have to make up a mind when you get in your 50s or 60s or you're just going to retire. And you're going to take it easy. See, God can't allow anybody to retire anymore from the ministry. If you've ever been touched, you've ever been anointed of God, you don't have time. You've got, you've got to say, God, use me. I don't care. I don't care where you send me. I don't care where you want me to go, but I'm not going out with my spirit drained. I'm not going out a dry stick. I want the anointing. I want the touch of God. I'm speaking to everybody, but the pastors in particular, I speak from my heart and I'm going to tell you, if you believe these are the last days, folks, have you not seen prophecy fulfilled in the last few years? It's going lightning speed. You hear the secular world screaming that the time is up. And we preach it, we, I've prophesied it, and, and every, with prophecies are everywhere. And you have prophecies coming from all over the world now. Jesus is that our time is up. The secularists are saying the same thing. Al Gore says we've got just a few years. <laughs> there are a number of you here have that burden of finances. And you seem to be going deeper and deeper and holds but a spirit of discouragement upon you. Some are going through marriage problems. It's one thing to come to a meeting, be able to raise your hands and hide what you're going through, but God sees that burden. He sees that, that, that terror, that, that feeling that something's not right. Others are fighting a besetting sin and you're discouraged because you can't seem to get the victory. I'm not even going to go into the matter of pornography because see, the simple fact is that if you're into that, God is very patient, loving. He's, he's probably spoken to you a thousand times already. But the time will come when God says, all right, I need you, and I love you, but I'm going to take your anointing. You're not going to have anything to say to anybody. You're going to be dry. You're going into the desert. I'll love you. I'll keep you. 
but you can't go with me and I won't go with you. It comes down to that. But that's where the discouragement comes from. You're fighting that battle. And God wants you to give the victory tonight because he needs you. God can't spare one now. He can't spare one of his soldiers. He can't spare me. He can't spare you. Unfulfilled expectations. Something you prayed about, something you thought God told you and it still hasn't come to pass. Somebody you prayed for, maybe a child, someone else. But please don't tell me that you want your child saved and you don't pray. You don't agonize for it. I've heard about revival for years and years. Past, I, Brother Raven, he'll work with me for five years on my staff. And he died a broken heart. Because he wrote Rive Revival Terry's and heard it for 50 years. And, and in his last hours, he was so wounded at the lightness of the pulpit. So many preachers, he called them light men. There was no heaviness. There was no weightiness. It was all lightness. It was foolishness. Now, I've waited and heard it talk about revival for years, but I, I finally don't want to hear much about it anymore because we really don't want to pay the price. We really don't want to pay the price. I, I want to take you before I close to Daniel, the 10th chapter, please. Go to chapter 9 first, verse 3. Here it is again. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made confession, and said, O Lord, the great dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. Now skip over to verse chapter 10, starting at verse 2. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three weeks. See, this man has just been in the word and he's read Jeremiah, and he knows that there's redemption coming, and he knows that world powers are going to be shaken. And so he sets his face. And that's what I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit in the power and the Holy Spirit. I'm saying to you, there has to come a time, and I pray it would be tonight, and it's not just being moved by something you hear. It's by a determination. It's the setting of the mind and saying, I hear you, Lord. That's what I want. And you set your mind, you set your heart now by an act of faith. By hearing the word of God and laying hold of it, God, I hear you. I know that you've been stirring my heart. I know I have some issues and I want to deal with them. I want to walk with you, but I want an anointing. I want my people to know when I stand in the pulpit again that something has touched my life. There's a change in me and dead churches are because of dead pastors, folks. That's, it boils down to that. And, and if, if your church is dead and God lavish you and you get that fresh anointing of the Lord, God will either wake them up or move you to a place that's fruitful. He, he will open doors for you. But God does miracles when you begin to seek his face and get back to the simplicity of this and you devour this word of God and you stay there. You turn everything down. Because I know when I sought the anointing, was willing to pay the price, I did more in three hours of business than I used to do a half a day. God will take care of that. But here's Daniel now, and he said, I ate no present bread. And you're going to be fasting, friends. This won't happen until God sees something in you and me of determination. God, I want this. I will not let you go until you anoint me again. Some of you have known the anointing. Some of you were on fire for God. Some of you prayed and you fasted and you were close to the heart of God and you spoke the word of God with, with something of fire and anointing and everybody knew it and you knew it. And something happened. I'm speaking to sisters as well. I ate no present bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks had been fulfilled. Well, verse 5, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. You see, he began to seek God, and his eyes became open. He began to see Christ. I believe he saw Jesus himself. His body was like burl, and his face, the appearance of lightning, his eyes, his lamps of fire, his arms and his feet, colored polished brass, and the voice of his words like thunder, a voice of a multitude. And listen to this now. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell on them so that they fled and hid themselves. Why does God move on one man? Now, Daniel would not be walking with evil men. So these had to be good men that were walking with him. And why is it that only one man hears it? Why is it that those others run and hide? Because the anointing is a very scary thing. 
the anointing will put to shame and send fear to those who know that's what they need, what they have missed. And it frightens and they hide. Folks, God doesn't want to pass you by in this hour. I'm not going to let him pass me by. He said, I won't pass you by. But he said, you're going to seek my face. Therefore, I was left alone. And I saw this great vision. There remained no strength in me. My comeliness was turned into corruption. I retained no strength. Will you skip down now? Or go to 10, verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me. There's the touch of God. Oh, God. Which set me upon my knees. And upon the palms of my hand. And he said unto me, Daniel, great beloved, understand the words that I speak to you now and stand upright for unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken the words unto me, I stood trembling. Listen to this. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, what? You did set your heart to understand and chasten yourself before thy God. Thy words were heard and I've come for thy words the day you set your heart I say to you in great love from the Lord and from his heart if you pay the price I'll open doors for you I'll speak through you and I'll use you again that you have never conceived this has not just for the ministry but those of you that are in the congregation you're not a pastor. You're not in the ministry of God speaking to you. Sister, you may be the one that God's calling to bring your husband back, your preacher's wife. You know your husband. You know if the anointing's there. So many letters I get from all over the country. And we get 25, 30,000 letters a month. And, and, and by the hundreds, will you pray for my husband? He's a pastor. And something's happening. And I don't want, it isn't, I'm scared. You God speak to you also. Folks, the time of being pumped up is over. God says, I'm tired of your solemn assemblies. I'm tired of your sacrifices. They're not from the heart. Don't miss what God's about to do. Don't miss it. God help me, I'm not going to miss it. I'm going out clinging to him. I don't know what else to say. I've said everything that I know that you've laid on my heart. Lord, I have not, a, I've not arrived. I'm still one of your weakest vessels. But, oh God, I know you told me that this anointing is available to any man, any woman who set their heart. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.